Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Healthy Aging Lecture. It is 11 o'clock and we are going to get started in just one to two minutes. We're giving folks a chance to jump on. So um, just hold tight. We'll be right back with you to get started. Thank you. Okay, let's get started, everyone. Again, welcome to today's Healthy Aging Lecture. My name is Kate Tutwapi. I'm the Manager of Senior Health here at Virginia Hospital Center. And I'm joined today with Blanca, my coworker in Senior Health. She's the Assistant Manager. Um, and I will be introducing our guests, um, guest speakers in just a moment. Um, so today's presentation, as you can see on the slide, is Write Your Prescription for Healthy Aging and Fall Safety. Uh, September is Falls Prevention Month, so we really want everyone to just take some time to think about how you can reduce your risks associated with a fall. Um, there are many ways to think about it, um, but certainly uh, thinking about the medications you're on and how they interact with each other is one very important step you can take to help minimize your risk and just to, to, to have a healthy aging, a healthy, healthy aging process as you go forward. So um, let me first remind everyone, in case you're new to our lecture on webinar here, um, everybody joined us on mute so that we could reduce that background noise, but we definitely encourage your questions and comments. You'll see a, a question box in your control panel. So please do feel free to type in any comments or questions you have throughout the presentation. We will definitely have an opportunity to um, review those and get you some answers. Okay, so with that, and oh, and one other thing I wanna remind everyone, um, all of these lectures, including this one, are recorded. So we send, I send this out to everyone who's registered for this webinar. You'll get a recording of it. You can listen to this presentation again. You can share it with anyone that you'd like. Um, and we will also be sending a copy of the slides. So um, you can just review those at your leisure um, and when I get those out early next week. All right, so I think that covers our, our housekeeping topics for now. Um, I want to introduce our two speakers, Jen Bingham there and Haley Vess. Both are pharmacists here at Virginia Hospital Center. So we're really looking forward to um, the information they have to share with us. And again, please feel free to, to send us those questions as they come to mind um, throughout the presentation. So thank you, Jen and Haley. I will turn it over to you guys um, to take it away. All right. So thank you for that introduction. Um, and yeah, like she said, we're going to be talking about healthy aging and how kind of your medications play into that and what you can do um, to prevent um, falls and fall safety and things like that. So our objectives, just our goals by the end of this discussion, I um, want you to be able to walk away and be able to describe how the risk of falls increase as you age and factors that contribute. 
um, recognize the changes that occur during aging and how it impacts medications, understand how healthcare professionals monitor drugs in, these, in patients, um, learn about pill burden and what healthcare professionals can do to help, specifically pharmacists, um, and also just some education about over-the-counter medications, um, how they can be effective, um, and also any safety concerns, and then identify some helpful resources for medication reviews. So starting out with just the impact of falls in the elderly adult. So one in four older Americans fall every year. Um, every 20 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. Uh, older adults who have fallen are twice as likely to fall again. And then one in five falls results in head injury or broken bones. And also 95% of hip fractures are caused by falls, which is one of the most like, prevalent um, and sometimes debilitating one that we can see. And women are more likely to fall than men. From a financial aspect, there's um, total amount spent for care um, in hospitals associated with falls in the older adult is roughly $744 million. This was as of 2014, so it's probably more than that now. So what are some risk factors um, for falls? So if there's a need for a cane or walker, um, this can kind of be indicative of poor balance, loss of strength. Um, if there's any bladder issues, so if you have to rush to get to the bathroom, um, anything that's requiring you to um, kind of have to move at a quicker pace where you wouldn't be able to take your time increases the risk for falls. Um, any numbness in the feet, this can be associated um, in those who have diabetes um, and you have like nephropathy or like nerve pain um, or nerve numbness in the feet. Side effects from medications, which we're gonna talk about more in depth throughout this lecture. Any sleep or mood medications, so anything that's affecting like your mental status, um, depression, and then any previous falls. Um, sometimes when an individual has a fall, it creates this sense of fear of falling again. Um, and um, sometimes that fear can actually perpetuate a fall in and of itself. So I do have a question, um, and this is just thought-provoking question to try to see, um, get your input. Uh, you can just respond in the chat. Um, so you are having lunch with your friend when she quickly stands up to refill her tea. She falls to the ground after taking one step. When you ask her what happened, she tells you she remembers standing up but cannot remember any other details. From where they are on the ground, you gauge that their chair is less than a foot away. What is the most likely reason that your friend fell? So A is her blood pressure dropped whenever she stood up. B is that she lost her balance. Or C is that she has minimal strength and endurance. So I'll give you just a minute to respond. And if you're not sure, that's okay, because I'm gonna give you the answer anyways in just a minute. <laughs> Haley, we did get a couple responses. Oh, awesome. Yeah. What'd they say? Well, so we had one that said all, all of the above essentially. We had one person that answered the blood pressure dropped. Mm -hmm. um, another person chose A and another person chose C. So. Okay, good. So I think all is a fair answer. <laughs> they can probably all be contributing, I agree. Um, so the detail in this question comes from the fact that you gauge that they're less than a foot away from their chair. So we have something called placement and prediction model. So looking at this, um, if they fall within a foot from the chair, this can be indicative of orthostatic um, hypotension. So yes, their blood pressure is bottoming out. Um, they stood up quickly, the blood all rushed um, out of their brain, they got dizzy and they fell. Um, if it's five to 10 feet away from the place that they stood up, this would be more indicative of loss of balance. And if it's greater than 15 feet away, this would be loss of strength and endurance. So when we think about how your medications can play a role in falls, um, 
we would generally, they would mo more than likely affect um, blood pressure. And then also they could contribute to the five to 10 feet away loss of balance. They would play less of a role in like strength, loss of strength and endurance, the 15 feet away category, um, but definitely in the first two. So kind of understanding before we go into like medications and how they can increase your risk of falls, I think it's important to understand how your body changes as you age. Um, so the two big things that we would look at from a pharmacy standpoint, so there's kidney and then the next slide's gonna be um, over the liver. So your kidney, you can think of it as just the filtration system of your body. And so due to the natural aging process, your kidney mass and weight declines by 10 to 43% over your lifespan. So what that means is that your filtration system is decreasing and also in circumstances where you may have like an acute issue that causes your kidney function to decline, this would lead to an increase in um, like toxic metabol or sorry, toxic substances um, because your kidney's not able, able to filter them out. So serum creatinine that you'll see listed on the screen, this is just one of the many measures that we use um, to determine, it kind of indicates your kidney function status. And we use this to um, decrease how much medication you may be getting. So that way it doesn't become toxic because it's not being filtered throughout your body. And I obviously don't expect you to memorize this list, <laughs> but this is just to show how many medications um, can be or have are impacted by your kidney. So like I said, it's the filtering system. So when that filtering system st stops working or declines, a lot of these drugs will accumulate and that can lead to side effects. Um, so as a pharmacist, we are constantly reviewing your medication list and also reviewing any changes in kidney function to ensure that that doesn't contribute to um, poor outcomes or poor um, health events. So next we have the liver. So the liver is generally um, the place where drugs will get broken down and then excreted. So also due to the natural aging process, your liver is smaller and there's less blood flow um, going through the liver. So that means that drugs are not being broken down and that they're still active in the body. So you can think um, liver would be deactivating the drugs and then um, the kidney is getting rid of those drugs. Um, and the liver, there are quite a few medications that has like, that their dose would need to be adjusted based off your liver function. Um, not near as many as the kidney though. Um, so I've listed them here, um, but just so you have an understanding that behind the scenes, if you're ever in the hospital or if you even outpatient are seeing your pharmacist on a regular basis, this is something that we do take into consideration. So what tools can we can like pharmacists use um, or even any medical professional use to assess uh, medication list and making sure that they are both effective and safe in the older adult. So one, there's kind of two categories. So one is error of omission. So it sh you should be on the medication, but you currently are not on the medication. So um, one of the criteria is called the START criteria. So it's the screening tool to alert doctors to the right treatment. So this is simply 34 rules relating to the most common prescription um, omissions. For example, if a patient has AFib and they're not on any type of like blood thinner, um, that would be an omission. That patient should be on a blood thinner if they have AFib. Another way to look at your medication list is error of appropriateness. So maybe you are on a medication and you don't necessarily need to be. So one is implicit criteria tool would be medication appropriateness index. So this is 10 questions to ask about each individual medication. 
So when I know as pharmacists, especially when we're looking at just your med list, like if we don't have any other information about a patient, we should be able to say, um, you know, this is the drug, this is the dose, this is the disease that this drug is treating. And then when we look at your diagnoses that you may have, if you don't have that diagnosis, then we would question, why are you on this drug? So all of your diagnoses and all of the medications that you're on should match appropriately. And this index kind of helps us assess where we're at in, the, in your treatment. And then for explicit criteria tools, so STOP criteria is screening tool of older people's potentially inappropriate prescriptions. Um, this is 80 rules relating to the most common um, prescription errors. So some examples of that would be if a patient, let's say a patient is on um, warfarin and they're taking like an NSAID, generally we want to avoid that. Um, and then also any type of benzodiazepine use for greater than four weeks, that would be something that would kind of alert us to assess how appropriate that is and if we can take that medication safely off of the list and get you off of it. Um, and then our main medication assessment tool that we really look at in the older adult population is the Beers criteria. So the Beers criteria is a guideline used by healthcare professionals to help improve the safety of prescribing medications for the older adults. And again, this goes back to the changes that occur in your body and how you are able to process the medications and then how the medications will respond based off of that. So it's five different lists that describe particular medications with evidence suggesting that they should either be avoided by most older people, um, avoided by older people with specific health conditions, used with caution because of the potential for harmful side effects, avoided in combination with other treatments because of the risk for harmful drug-drug interactions, and then dosed differently or avoided among people with reduced kidney function. Um, so again, these are just like the big five. There is a lot of crossover between these lists in certain categories of medications. Um, and I wanted to, there is a nifty Beers criteria like pocketbook that you're able to print off. Um, I attached the pocketbook here. Obviously, I know it's probably very small and you're not able to read it, but it truly is just those five lists. It has the classes of drugs um, and then why they should be avoided or side effects that could happen. Um, and we are going to send out this link after the lecture so that if you wanted to print this off um, and you can keep it with you, if you have like a medical file that you take with you every time you go to the doctor's office, you could keep it in there as a reference tool. Um, or you might just look at it and look at your medications and just kind of see where you're at. Again, this is not a list. Here's the second part of the pocketbook. Um, this isn't a list to say, um, we don't know, like healthcare providers won't necessarily use this all the time to say like you absolutely cannot be on this medication because it's on the beers list. Um, this again is just a guideline. Uh, all healthcare professionals should be considering the age of their patient whenever they're prescribing medications. So don't be alarmed if you are on these medications. Um, it's just a good idea to be aware of them. And so when you go to your doctor or you do um, like a med review with your pharmacist, you're able to kind of bring up these things um, and just be educated and have that um, empowerment to take control of your own um, medication list. Haley, can I ask a quick question that came up in yeah. reference to this um, beers list? In the context of this beers list, what is considered an older adult? Do you know what age they're taking into consideration here for this list? Yes, so 65 and older. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so some of the big drugs, how I was saying that um, there's gonna be some crossover in drug classes in these five different categories in the Beers criteria. So some of the big medications that you'll see as, um, for lack of a better word, like repeat offenders on these lists, are gonna be your cardiac medications. 
So the biggest side effects with these, um, so hypoperfusion or your blood is not being perfused appropriately to all of your vital organs and throughout your um, vasculature. Uh, hypotension, um, so low blood pressure. Bradycardia would be like a low heart rate. Any um, heart beat abnormalities, dizziness, fainting, um, and again, that mental status changes. So all of those side effects would perfectly um, encompass a situation that could lead you to fall. Um, and these classes, so medication classes like antihypertensives, so you can think like clonidine would be an agent um, or propranolol. Diuretics, so that's your fluid pills, your Lasix, um, your spironolactone, your hydrochlorothiazide. And then some of the antiarrhythmic agents, so um, procanamide um, or quinidine. So again, these are the most, um, most you, or sorry, these often can lead to those episodes where you are having low blood pressure um, and you're not able to effectively get the blood everywhere that it needs to go in your body. Um, and whenever that happens, uh, you are more likely to fall. And another big class that's a very, very broad class uh, are like anticholinergics. But the biggest thing to take away from here is that there's side effects. Um, it can be like constipation, um, blurry vision, dry mouth, confusion, dizziness, drowsiness, and difficulty concentrating. So anytime you think of a choliner, anticholinergic, the side effects you can think of is like drying effect throughout the body um, and then mental status changes as well. So this would be, when I say mental status changes, that can be like confusion, um, you become like disoriented to your surroundings, um, drowsiness um, and dizziness. So some of these drugs, um, I won't bore you with all the medication list names, but any type of muscle relaxer, uh, so like Flexeril um, or Soma, if you're on either of those, that could cause it. Um, anything that would help with like nausea, anti-nausea. So promethazine is a really big one. Um, and then antipsychotics like olanzapine or Zyprexa or Seroquel. And then one of the biggest classes that I see that is commonly overlooked would be your antihistamines. So Benadryl and hydroxyzine. Um, and I think the biggest thing with these is that they are over the counter. So they're readily available. Um, you know, if you get, I don't know, you get a bee sting or an amp eye and it's really irritating. Um, it's not unreasonable to go to the store, pick up some Benadryl and start taking it to help with that. Um, but in the older adult, since that drug isn't being cleared as it normally would be in a younger adult, it can stick around for a long time and lead to those um, episodes of like drowsiness, um, blurry vision, um, and that would end up leading to a fall. And I do want to mention that um, there's Benadryl as like an antihistamine that we kind of think of as like our big gun, but you also have your antihistamines like um, Zyrtec or Allegra or Claritin, any of those. So those drugs are less likely to lead to these um, severe side effects, um, but it's good just to be aware that if you are taking Zyrtec on a regular basis and then you add Benadryl, you know, just as needed for that bee sting, um, they're both acting in the same way. So just keep that in mind whenever you are taking over-the-counter medications, which Jen is gonna talk about later, so I won't go too much into that. <laughs> oh, she's gonna talk about it in just a minute. <laughs> Do we have any questions about Beer's criteria or those two big kind of umbrella classes that I talked about? Uh, nothing yet. I'm in those areas, um, Haley, but thank you. That was that was helpful. Yeah. All right. And I will pass it off to Jen. All 
Okay, good morning. Um, like I said, my name is Jen, um, and I just wanted to go through a couple more things with you all. Uh, the first is gonna be about pill burden. Um, and I'm sure as many of you know, that a lot of uh, people take a lot of medications. Uh, this is an example of one of our lists, and I just wanna pause for a moment and see uh, if anybody can count up how many medications or how many pills somebody might take in one day if they were if this was their list. So I'll give it about 30 seconds to a minute and we'll see if we get any answers. We are getting a few answers, Jen. Great. What do we got? So we have a response of 12 and another guess or a response of 11. Yes, very close. So um, we did count 13, but only because we counted that weekly tablet. Uh, and so that is a lot of a lot of pills to take in one day. Uh, and it can be very frustrating trying to get all of this down, um, even though every single one of them are very important. Um, so as we are looking at them, uh, I just wanted to share some of the statistics and what we can do about pill burden. So uh, in people that are over the age of 65, 44% uh, of men and 57% of women will take five or more medications per day. Um, and 12% of our uh, adults over the age of 65, they'll take 10 or more medications per week. And so that will include uh, things like our uh, bisphosphonates for our bones that we take once weekly, or like on that last list that we had the vitamin D that's only taken once weekly. Uh, so it's estimated that this uh, could lead to over 150,000 premature deaths and more than 4.6 million hospitalizations due to medication overload. Part of the problems with, problem with this uh, is that People tend to use multiple pharmacies, and so that can increase the risk of an adverse event. Uh, and part, part of this is because the pharmacist at each pharmacy may not know some of the other medications that somebody is taking. And so these adverse drug events uh, happen in 58% of patients who are taking at least five drugs, and they can happen in greater than 80% of patients who are taking seven or more drugs. So one of these examples is there was a study that looked at Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, when they left skilled nursing facilities, they found that patients were prescribed uh, an average of 14 prescriptions. Six out of those 14 uh, prescriptions were found to exacerbate the underlying uh, geriatric syndromes. Um, and so potentially something off of those fears lists that Haley was talking about um, or some interactions between those medications. And then there's a strong correlation in from that study that shows uh, the number of medications and the number of falls, uh, there was a correlation. So some of the things that we're doing as health, uh, healthcare professionals is trying to de-prescribe when possible. So trying to look and see, do you really need this medicine? Is it something that's helping you? Uh, is it something that you were prescribed when you were in the hospital and then you don't need it anymore? Uh, we love to change from short-acting to long-acting medications. Uh, this helps to go from a, a two-time daily dosing down to a one-time daily dosing. Uh, we utilize multi-drug or combination pills. Um, a lot of our blood pressure medications will combine two drugs to help us reduce that to just one pill. Uh, and then also making sure that we have effective strength and dose of medications. Uh, so if you're taking a couple medications for blood pressure, do we need two of them or do we just need a higher dose of one of them? And trying to make sure we're maximizing and optimizing your therapy. Uh, we really don't like to give you more than twice daily dosing. Uh, three times a day is very difficult. I know even I struggle. Uh, I had a medication that was twice a day and I probably forgot that second dose three or four times a week because it's just a very hard thing to do, especially if it's in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, so we do try to uh, make sure it is just once daily or something you can take in the morning and evening uh, and avoiding those midday doses. 
And then also trying to avoid those as needed doses. Um, so making sure that uh, we are controlling, one big example is with anxiety, we often see benzodiazepines uh, being prescribed and you take those as needed when there's an anxiety attack, uh, but we would prefer to see somebody on uh, a medication that they take every morning to prevent that anxiety from happening in the first place. So now we're gonna get into some of the over-the-counter products. Haley did a great job of introducing a few of the topics we're gonna talk about here. So the Institute for Safe Medication Practices is one of the organizations that uh, they try to collect all of the safety events that happen around the nation, and then they uh, put out reports and recommendations for doctors and pharmacists. Uh, so when it comes to using uh, over-the-counter medication safely, uh, we recommend that you consult your doctor or pharmacist before purchasing that uh, over-the-counter product, uh, partly due to any sort of drug interactions. Um, reading the label carefully to make sure that there's not a duplicate or if it, there's a major interaction, it's usually on that label. Uh, to not take medications with the same active ingredients, and I have a few examples uh, coming up. And then to treat the, only the symptoms that you have. Uh, this is very common with our cold medications uh, that somebody may be congested and have a cough, uh, but do, they don't have a headache. And so uh, our, our cold medicines will have that Tylenol in addition to an antihistamine and an expectorant, but the Tylenol may not be necessary. So trying to avoid any, any unnecessary medication. Always keep a current list of the medications you take. Uh, to include herbal supplements and the over-the-counter medications. Uh, to, so if you end up going to the emergency department or going to the doctor, you can share what over-the-counter medications you're taking. Uh, do remember that herbal supplements are not the same as over-the-counter medication. Herbal supplements aren't regulated. I'll be talking a little bit about it, more about it later. Uh, but over-the-counter medications are approved by the FDA and have the the research uh, behind them uh, for the dosing and formulation that they have. Always check the expiration date. That's a big thing for uh, medicines in our cabinet. We always have that um, Tylenol that we bought three years ago when we had the flu and uh, we haven't taken it since. So making sure that it's within date. Uh, once it passes uh, the expiration date, the efficacy starts to go away um, and it may uh, cause harm more than it helps. For liquids especially, you only want to use the device that comes with that product. You don't want to use a household teaspoon or shot glass to take your medication because uh, every company makes it a little bit different size. And so using the device that comes with that, that product, so that little plastic cup that's on top of your NyQuil, use that to measure your, your dose out. And then always uh, seek medical attention if your symptoms get worse or if you experience side effects. On most of our uh, packages, it will say how long you can treat yourself. Uh, so uh, two to three days or treat for seven days um, in order to determine whether or not it's working and if you need uh, uh, more medical attention than, than self-care. So here is our drug fact label. I'm sure all of us have seen this. I just wanted to review uh, what we have here. One of the most important things will be our active ingredient. Uh, and this goes back to what Haley was saying. Uh, and then I'll have another slide uh, that different medications may have the exact same thing in it with a different name. And we don't wanna be taking more than what's recommended uh, by taking two different brands of a medication. We have our uses, uh, so making sure that it's what we're treating. Uh, with this one, it's the um, chlorphenamine, it's an antihistamine, so it's sneezing, runny nose, itchy eyes, itchy throat. So if you have that chest congestion, something like this may not be helpful. Then we have our warnings, our directions, um, and then any storage information that's on here as well. I know some people uh, do have allergies to non-medications, and so that inactive ingredient uh, box is also very important if you have any allergies to uh, non-medications. Here is a picture of one of those day and night cold medicines. Um, we see the, uh, the acetaminophen or the Tylenol highlighted. 
But then we also uh, see that we have the dextromethorphan, which is our uh, cough suppressant, and then our phenylephrine, which is our nasal decongestion in there. Uh, so looking at these drug fact labels, uh, it's really important to make sure that you're not taking two things thinking they're different when they're, they really do have that same active ingredient. So getting back into the herbal supplements, um, the FDA does not review herbal supplements for safe use before they're marketed. Um, these are labeled as natural, but natural doesn't always mean safe. We don't know uh, what's being put in, um, and we don't know how uh, it interacts in different bodies. So there was a study conducted in 20, uh, from 2014 to 2013 uh, that found that herbal supplements were the culprit of more than 130 non-medication serious liver in, uh, injuries. So 45 of those were from bodybuilding herbals and supplements. Um, and then we had 85 of those that were supplements that were for weight loss and sexual enhancement, enhancement agents. 13% um, of those uh, led to liver transplant or death. Uh, we do have these two links at the bottom of the slide. These are two reliable sources that talk a lot about herbal, herbal medication. Uh, so if there's something that has been suggested or something that you'd like to try, you may want to go look at those websites and see uh, what some of the risks and benefits are and if there are any studies that support the use uh, for whatever you're taking it for. We do have some vitamins in here. Um, one of the things that I would like to bring up is uh, there's a USP stamp of approval for some vitamins. Uh, if you're looking at a bottle, uh, in the, the corner, it will have a little green and gold stamp of approval. And what that means is uh, that the US Pharmacopeia, it's a big organization that looks at herbals, they've inspected the facility and what is inside that pill is what the bottle says is inside that pill. Uh, if it hasn't been approved by the USP, there may be quite a variety of what is in actually in that product. So the use of herbal and dietary supplements by older adults has increased from 14% to 63% uh, from 1998 to 2010. And so we are seeing this a lot more in combination with our prescription medications. Uh, vitamin D is a big one that we would see. Uh, we see this as both a prescription and uh, a non-prescription vitamin. Uh, we recommend this for to maintain bone health. Uh, one of the reasons is that oftentimes older adults spend less time outside and therefore less exposure to sunlight. Um, we recommend using vitamin D3 as this is the natural form your body makes from sunlight. Uh, and then we have the recommendations there at the bottom as well. Uh, when we have vitamin D within our um, arsenal, uh, when you do, if there is a fall, maybe your bones are, hopefully your bones are strong enough that it doesn't result in that fracture that lands you in the hospital. Then we have vitamin C, another bone health vitamin. Uh, this, uh, this vitamin helps with the natural aging process, uh, and so we can maintain our bone health as well. Uh, what's interesting about this one is the recommendation for younger adults is like a 10% of what we recommend for older adults. Uh, in some of our combination pills, um, like the the one one a day uh, vitamins, those are something that would have uh, the vitamin C in it. Vitamin B12, we recommend this one to prevent anemia, a neuropathy, or numbness, and then cognitive impairment. Uh, so as you get older, your ability to absorb vitamin B12 from your diet is decreased due to um, acid and stomach changes, enzyme changes that are needed to process that vitamin out of the food that we eat. So we recommend having 2.4 micrograms daily of vitamin B12. Uh, sometimes B12 uh, can become serious enough that you end up getting B12 shots from your doctor. Uh, I believe those tend to be monthly shots if, you, if it gets to that point. Uh, vitamin B6 is another great B vitamin. Uh, this one helps with anemia and it's needed to form red blood cells. Uh, and we have our recommendations there as well. And so uh, 
finally, I just wanted to uh, bring up a few things. How do we bring all of this up with uh, your doctor or your pharmacist? How do you reduce your pill burden? How do you talk about the beers criteria? Uh, and feeling empowered and ready to uh, take your medication list uh, and be ready to, to use that and may know that you're taking the right things. So medication management is a big part of what Medicare does uh, for older adults. Uh, in Medicare Part B for your annual wellness visit, I recommend asking your doctor if they have a pharmacist in the clinic who can review your medications. Uh, they can sit with you, dig through each of the medications, make sure that uh, it's all appropriate, um, and they would make recommendations to your doctor whether or not you need to change something or uh, discontinue something. Uh, for Medicare Part D, uh, if you have a Part D plan, the, the sponsors are required to have an established medication therapy management program. Um, and so if you call your insurance provider, they should be able to connect you to your medication therapy management service. Uh, and then they would either do a phone call appointment um, or set up an appointment with you to go through all of your medications. And then lastly, uh, your local pharmacy. Uh, many pharmacies already have established programs that work with your insurance. Uh, so when you go into your pharmacist, you can see if they can connect you to that MTM service. Um, sometimes uh, the pharmacies have a list, and so maybe some of you have been called uh, being offered this service. Uh, and if you haven't, uh, just ask your pharmacist if they can help you out. And so with that, uh, that is all we have today. Uh, what questions do you have um, about this section or if something came up about the first part that Haley had? We are happy to answer those for you. Great, thank you so much, Jen and Haley. That was terrific. Lots of um, kind of in-depth, thorough information. Um, you actually touched on in one of your last slides, one of the questions that did come up, um, we had an audience member that was interested in just knowing like how to go about getting that review with a, a pharmacist or a physician, but a pharmacist really, um, and how often, but it sounds like annual or is that sufficient to do an annual review or would there be other circumstances that you might want to do it more regularly? Yeah, so I think that through your insurance, you can get like a very in-depth session with a with like a pharmacist who's like attached to a clinic once a year. Now, if you fill your prescriptions like at a um, community pharmacy, um, they have lists, and even here at the hospital in our outpatient pharmacy, um, there's like different factors, and depending on what medications you are you are on it'll flag the pharmacist and generate a list of patients who they should call and offer um, to do a med review with them. Um, so I think you can get one like big official one covered on your insurance through a pharmacist that's attached to like a clinic. However, if something comes up throughout the year and you feel like you need another one, you can always call your local community pharmacy and request one and the pharmacist will go through it with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Additionally, if you ever end up in the hospital or uh, some major event happens uh, with your health, that's a good time to add an extra one during the year. Um, lots of people will come in the hospital, things are changed. Make sure uh, when you get home that you, you're asking those questions, uh, what was changed and why was it changed? Terrific. Thank you. Here's a question about um, Vitamin B, will a B complex take place, take take the place of B12 and B6? Yes, so yes. that will, um, I would refer you to look at the active ingredients or like the um, what's listed on the vitamin bottle of what's actually in it. So B complex, I think generally most of the B complex that I've seen, it does include B12 and B6. And out next to the list, out next to like B6 and B12, it should tell you how much is in there. Now, I think different B complex, it's not standardized, right? So different B complexes can have different amounts and different type of B vitamins. There's more than just B6 and B12. Um, more than likely they'll be in there, but yes, it would take the place if you have a B complex. Um, you wouldn't also need to take B12. Um, unless the B complex 
doesn't have B12 in it. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'll let the person respond back in if um, they okay. have any follow-up questions, but yeah, thank you. Um, Here's a kind of a practical question. Have you, do you have any suggestions of how someone can kind of organize their list of medications? I mean, do you see anything that kind of strikes you as a good way? Is it just simply writing down a list and keeping it in your wallet or purse or any other suggestions or strategies for kind of keeping track of all those medications and, and how you're taking up or the dosage and so forth? My, so uh, before I became a pharmacist, I worked in an emergency department um, talking to patients about their medication history when they would come in uh, to ensure that the doctors knew what they were taking. And my favorite was when people would use um, like a Microsoft Excel sheet or some sort of Word document to have everything typed up. I know not everybody has that as an option. Um, so even a little notebook, uh, that you're able to go through and cross something out or write it down uh, and in a way that makes sense to you. Um, I know some people, they like to think about, this is for my blood pressure, I'm going to put it in a blood pressure grouping. Um, other people want to put it alphabetically. And I think more importantly, what's easy for us, I think it's more important what's easy for you and what makes sense to you. So why, uh, which, whether it's alphabetical or grouped up, um, and in a way that's accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't want to set up a big computer Excel sheet if you're only on your computer once a week. Um, you'd want to be able to put that, maybe put it in a notebook so you can get to it easily. Another good spot is the notes app on your phone. If you do have a smartphone, I think all of them have like some types of some type of notes and you can update it that way as well. Um, another thing I want to mention is don't worry about having like perfect spelling of the medication. Um, as long as you've got it written down, um, as pharmacists, we see a whole slew of ways that drugs can be spelled. We ourselves sometimes are like, how do you spell this particular drug? Um, so just write it down how it sounds and we will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. Thank you. Here's another one about vitamins. Um, if you're not taking vitamin C, B6, B12, should you start this regimen if you're over 65? I know vitamin D and vitamin B12 are generally recommended. Now, I preface that with always checking with your doctor, your primary care physician, before you start any type of over-the-counter um, drug or vitamin, but generally it is recommended. Um, B6 and vitamin C are kind of like additional add-on, or additional add-ons, that's the same thing, but um, okay. yeah, you can double check with your doctor, but generally it is, um, recommended to do the vitamin D and the vitamin B12. Great, thank you. All right, well, um, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time, but I do wanna remind the audience that you'll get this recording, you'll get the slides. I'll also include some of the links and the, the, um, both Jen and Haley included um, so that you can reference like the beers document and some of the other things um, that were discussed throughout the presentation. So this is terrific. Thank you. I hope everybody um, gained some knowledge today. And um, I want to thank everybody for joining us for this presentation. Next month, we're going to be talking about stroke prevention, stroke prevention, response and recovery. So I hope um, you'll join us for that. Jen and Haley, thank you so much for this um, lecture today. We're really glad you could join us. And I hope everybody has a terrific weekend. Enjoy this nice fall weather. So this concludes thank the webinar. Yes, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. everyone. <laughs>